Get started with the basics of bird watching virtual class. I want to thank everybody for joining me here on this little adventure. Uh, and I say adventure because this is my first time hosting a virtual online class. I have hosted this class for several years now, but this is my first time doing it electronically. But uh, we're making do, right? Uh, we all are during this uh, during this time. I'm Barbara Spagnolo. I'm the Natural Resource Specialist for the Town of Castle Rock Parks and Recreation Department. I have been with the town for almost 15 years, helping the town manage our open space and trails and providing educational programs like this one to the public. I myself, um, my background is wildlife biology, but my passion, my hobby is bird watching. Uh, I got hooked on bird watching, studying wildlife biology in college back in the 90s. I got my first wildlife oriented job in the summer of 94 researching chestnut sided warblers in the White Mountain National Forest of New Hampshire. At the time, I didn't even know what the chestnut sided warbler was or what the job would entail, but I was hooked after the, the first couple of outings trying to find their nests and um, analyze their uh, breeding success in forested areas. After that, I took a bird watching class in college and uh, I never looked back. I've been bird watching ever since. I've gotten my mom hooked on bird watching. Uh, my husband was not a bird watcher when I met him and uh, he thought there were only a handful of birds on the planet, including geese, pigeons, gulls, robins. And then he saw a indigo bunting and he was hooked. The world of bird watching welcomes all. And I, I hope you will all uh, learn some new tricks or realize that uh, you want to take up bird watching as a backyard hobby or a more aggressive hobby and you can travel the world to try to find birds. Today's class is going to be an introduction. I want you to uh, know about the basics to get started with bird watching and how you can get started just in your own backyard. And I realize that um, we are all um, different levels of bird watchers here. Some of you might be beginners, some of you might be experts, and if you are an expert, hopefully I will uh, live up to expectations. Um, I myself, even though I've been birding for several decades now, um, I, I don't consider myself an expert. I feel like I can still learn from the experts, and um, the experts themselves will say the same thing. There's a funny quote that the difference between a beginning birder and an experienced birder is that the beginner birder has misidentified just a few birds. The experienced bird birders have misidentified thousands. So I have a presentation to offer to you tonight and hopefully I can get this to, uh, to work. So let's see. All right, so hopefully this is uh, this has been shared with everybody. So we are going to go through. There is my contact information, the, um, the office number. You can leave a message there for me. If you have questions, you see a bird or um, you need help trying to find binoculars or et cetera. Um, I will get that voicemail, but during this time I'm working remotely. So I asked um, if you try to get in touch with me, use either my cell phone or my email. And please um, call me, email me. Um, I would, um, I would love to answer um, any questions that you have. Let me just make sure I got this screen up the right way. Just a second. All right. Display settings. All right, moving on. All right, so the class tonight, this is what we're going to cover. Um, there, there's a lot to get started with bird watching, but um, the first thing is definitely realizing that, um, that birds are all around us. And um, the first thing will be binoculars that we will cover. Uh, but throughout this presentation, I'm going to cover the five tips for beginning birders. Make sure you have a field guide and binoculars. And a field guide, I'm going to get into that. 
uh, second, research birds in your region. Third, study birds and take notes before searching field guides. Four, consider adding a bird feeder or specific plants to your backyard that can attract birds. And then lastly, join other birders. And I will be covering all of those five tips during this presentation tonight. What exactly is bird watching? Well, uh, like the screen says, your lifetime ticket to the theater of nature. Bird watching or birding is a form of wildlife observation in which the observation of birds is a recreational activity or citizen science driven. Um, bird watching basically means just to observe birds. You can call it birding, you can call it bird watching, um, but you're basically just learning to identify the birds and understanding what they're doing. You really just need binoculars and a field guide to get started. That's why I love this hobby. Um, if you have a, a small backyard and your bird feeders are close to your back windows, you might not even need binoculars. Why should you watch birds? Few other activities can be done by almost anybody, anywhere, anytime, any place. Um, grandparents, young kids, city dwellers, um, uh, folks living in remote cabins, Antarctic um, researchers, uh, folks on islands, you can do it anywhere. Um, just not driving. I, I want to say that that's a problem that I get into. Sometimes I lose my concentration when I'm driving and I see a bird fly by. Birding is the number one sport in America. It really is, uh, just because it applies to so many people of so many different levels. Uh, that's according to the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, when you bird, you get a lot of benefits that I wanna highlight. Um, it's fun. Um, you get, it, it can be a healthy activity if you go out and hike and walk around to find the birds. Um, trying to find the birds can be very satisfying. Um, it, it's a great opportunity to have quality family time together, trying to find these birds. You'll um, generate um, an appreciation for nature, because often when you are bird watching, you'll encounter other signs of wildlife or native plants around you, or maybe you'll see a butterfly before you see a bird. Um, bird watching can offer either solitude or it can offer companionship. Um, I like to highlight that um, my husband, as I mentioned, he was not a bird watcher when he and I first met, and now he is my um, my partner. We go out bird watching all the time. In fact, we we planned our honeymoon around a bird watching trip. So um, that was our companionship. I'm really grateful that that happened. There are a lot of terms that. I've already started mentioning, and you might hear as you get involved in the world of bird watching. Uh, you can call yourself a bird watcher or a birder. It is perfectly acceptable to use either. Uh, there is a general feeling that um, birders are more aggressive, more scientific. Uh, they're actually searching out. They might actually do trips specifically to find birds, whereas bird watching can be more casual. But either term is fine by me. Uh, ornithologists are definitely reserved for the scientists that are uh, studying these birds. A life list is something that birders will generate. It's just basically a catalog of everybody you have seen in your life. And it can get into the hundreds um, if you stay in North America. It can get into the thousands if you venture out into other countries to find birds. A lifer term, that means a bird you've never seen before. It's exciting to see one for the first time. And um, the big year, that's another term you might not have ever heard of before. Bird watchers or intense birders will actually take a, an entire year off from work or um, other obligations and try to see and document as many birds as possible in one year. Uh, there was actually a great movie. It was a very funny movie based on a book about the big year. And I encourage you to find that. In, I suddenly have a brain block of what it was called, but it had Steve Martin in it. So if you look up the Steve Martin movie about birders in the big year, you'll find it. It is good. And rarities, that refers to birds that should not be in an area. And um, that can happen anytime because of a storm. That can happen because a bird gets lost or a bird hooks up with other 
um, individuals that are not necessarily um, its species, but they're very similar, such as the example I want to give for that is whooping cranes. They are an endangered bird. They are very endangered. There was uh, a whooping crane spotted in Monta Vista National Wildlife Refuge here in Colorado in the late 90s, simply because it was found with a whole bunch of sandhill cranes. He just happened to, to hook up with those guys, but he was a rarity in that area. So you never know what you might find. Some tips to get started with bird watching. Like I said, you need a binocular and a field guide because you need to know what you're looking at. It just helps to know what you're looking at because it can op open up another world of information when you can identify a specific bird. Um, spotting scopes are helpful. Um, I actually didn't get my first spotting scope uh, until about five or six years ago. So it's not necessarily needed. They are cumbersome to take around in the field, but they are great for trying to see waterfall, waterfowl on um, lakes and reservoirs. A camera is sometimes helpful. If you see that bird and you get a photo of it, it helps you look for better identifying marks later on. Um, the skills mentioned right there, you can develop skills every time you go out to bird watch. And um, connections, uh, that applies to um, getting with other people. Going out and bird watching with other individuals helps you become a better bird watcher because they might see things with the bird itself and it's identifying marks that you don't see. Or maybe they have better long distance eyesight and they can make out a bird farther away than you can. But classes, classes are, are definitely helpful in learning how to bird watch. Every bird watcher will have a different technique for the most part, different tips. That's why I recommend taking different classes um, such as this one. And you might take another class with Denver Audubon, and that instructor might offer more information than I would. So I, I highly recommend getting out and um, checking out other opportunities to learn from other instructors. Um, I will get into apps that is related to field guides and how to identify uh, the birds. But, um, you know, uh, study the birds, which might be found in your area. I'm going to go over some that you might casually find right here in the Castle Rock Douglas County area. But um, consider adding a bird feeder or specific plants to your backyard to encourage birds to come in. But joining other birds, birders will help you, will provide wonderful information. Um, I, uh, I had a boss at a nature center in New Jersey where I'm from who was an excellent um, birder and it was a joy to go out with him and learn so many techniques from him. He had been birding for many, many, many years before I worked with him. So he had a lot of experience to share with me. So I, I do recommend um, finding somebody who has experience. Hopefully I'm giving you some experience and helpful information right today. So let's get into binoculars. That is really the, the main thing you need to get involved with bird watching. Some birds will sit in one place for a while and you don't need binoculars and you can easily recognize them. But there are other birds that move around a lot and your eyes just can't see that distance. So they need some assistance. That's where binoculars come. They will help you get um, up close to the birds and make out the identifying marks so you can um, determine which bird you're seeing. So binoculars are described by two uh, they they basically have specific parts. As the screen shows you, you have a diopter ring, ocular lenses, a focus ring. Obviously, what the focus ring does is bring the op object into focus, and the objective lens. The objective lenses is the determination of how much light is coming into the binoculars, and that's important because. If, if an image is dark, you're not going to be able to make out uh, wing bars or maybe an eye ring or specific colors. The information on the right, you see the 32 millimeter, 50 millimeter, seven times and 10, 7x and 10x. So those refer to both the objective and the magnification. Binoculars are described by two numbers, um, seven by 50 millimeters, let's just say that. 
my binoculars are eight by 42. The first number refers to the magnification or how many times closer an object will appear when looking through the binocular com compared to the naked eye. The second number indicates the size of that objective lenses. Those are on the far side of the binocular. It's um, also known as the light gathering lens. Bin uh, binoculars that have a bigger ratio between that first number and the second number will have a sharper, brighter image than the ones with a smaller ratio. Um, but I, there's words of caution that I want to give here about binoculars. Um, you might want to find a pair of binoculars that have a, a huge objective lens um, width. The 50 millimeter is an example on the screen there. That's great, lets in a lot of light, but I want to caution you that it will be um, heavier in your hands. So if you don't feel like carrying something around that's that's heavy, don't get something with a wide objective lens. 50 millimeters is kind of pushing it. That's why a lot of bird watchers, the standard is eight by 42 or 10 by 42 is also good. Um, I do not recommend using um, something called uh, marine binoculars. I've never handled them myself, but I have been told that marine binoculars um, provide a very long um, distance, uh, very wide objective lens. They're going to be very heavy, not something useful for a bird watcher, because if you want to walk around to try to find birds, carrying something heavy is not conducive to that. There's a lot of names out there in the binocular world. Names that uh, might sound familiar, might not. Canon, Bushnell, Nikon, Pentax. Those are all common names, but there's also Zeiss, Swarovski, Leica, Pentax, Leupold, and Swift. And binoculars can range in price from $50, they're not very good, to thousands of dollars. For the average bird watcher, if you want to get into bird watching, you can spend about $200 to $250 on a good pair. But what I want to recommend that you try out a pair of binoculars. Do not order binoculars over the internet. Instead, go to um, a sporting goods store, whether it's Dick's, uh, Big Five, or uh, Murdoch's, um, or Cabela's. Probably not Murdoch, sorry, Cabela's. They will have binoculars there um, and test them out in your hands because what might feel good in your hands might not um, be helpful in, say, your, your birding partner. Um, I'm speaking specifically um, on past experience. My husband and I both have different pairs of binoculars and we uh, we have different preferences. He has bigger hands than I do, so his binoculars are bigger. Um, I have a, a smaller pair that fits very well in my hands. Um, so I want to caution you to, uh, to that explanation about your binoculars and your husband's binoculars or your kid's binoculars or your partner's binoculars. Have your own pair of binoculars. I, I can't stress that enough. Um, I love to tell this quick story. Again, I'm going to bring up my husband, um, but uh, he has he has been my birding partner for over 24 years now. We were starting to bird watch, and we were down in Florida, and we found an osprey nest. And we had one pair of binoculars between the two of us. We were poor college students. We thought the one pair of binoculars would be enough. So I have the binoculars first, and I'm checking out this osprey. Female is rotating the eggs and I am just like fascinated and I almost become frozen there and I, I do not hand the binoculars off to my husband to show them because I'm just so intrigued by watching this bird move their eggs around in their nest. I finally give the binoculars over to my husband. He looks up at the nest and the bird has flown away. To this day, we just celebrated our 24th wedding anniversary. To this day, he still jokes about, oh, that time Osprey was rotating its eggs. He's still a little, little bitter that I didn't share 
binoculars with him so he could enjoy uh, the nature observation. So please make sure you get your own pair of binoculars and test them out before you try to find them, maybe at a cheaper price um, on Amazon or online somewhere. That's my word of caution about using binoculars. So again, standard birding is eight by 42 or 10 by 42 is also good. Binoculars will come in two different varieties and that's it. Either they have, and it's based on their prisms. It's either a roof prism or a poro prism. It affects the clarity of the image that comes through. Uh, the roof prisms, it will have um, two prisms that basically overlap each other. And because of that, it, the image will come through in a relatively straight line, which means it will be clear and um, you won't lose the clarity of the actual image. Poro prisms, the um, objective or front lens will be offset from the eyepiece. As you can see in this image right here, it's offset. So the image has to bounce around between two different prisms before it gets to your own eye. Therefore, you lose the clarity in the image. And the clarity is important because with birding, and you're trying to identify a little tiny bird, say a hummingbird. A hummingbird is the smallest flying creature we have. Um, they can fit, a couple of them can fit in the palm of your hand. You need to be able to see minute differences in the bird. Uh, what color is its throat? Uh, what color are the wings and the tail? And that image can get fuzzy by bouncing around in a binoculars that are poro prisms. I recommend the roof prisms. That is the ones that I have. They are more expensive to manufacture, but generally have better quality images. Steps for choosing the binoculars you will love. First, consider what type of birding you plan to do. Is it just in your backyard and you're gonna be sitting at your kitchen window? Well, then get a big pair of binoculars with a very big objective lens to let in more light. If you are an active birder and you take your binoculars when you go hiking, make sure you don't get a pair that's very heavy. Decide what your price, is, your price range is ahead of time. You know, it's just like any product. If, if you're buying a new car and your limit is 30,000, make sure you don't spend more than 30,000. Um, pick a man magnification, whether it's the eight or the 10 or the 12. Test out a lot of models. And if you wear glasses, test the models out wearing your glasses because there are some binoculars that come with uh, a rubber eyepiece and that is generally better for folks wearing glasses so that way when you bring the binoculars up to your face they hit the glasses they'll you will hit the rubber on the binoculars and you won't shatter your glasses that's probably something none of us want um so that gets into the, the eye relief. That's what I mentioned, the, the eye relief of some binoculars, it's rubber. And if you don't wear glasses, maybe you don't wanna wear, you don't wanna look for that. Uh, but review additional features and warranties. Some of them might come with a one-year warranty. If you drop a pair of binoculars, you probably have to get a new pair because they will, um, that will shift the prisms inside binoculars, which means you won't be able to get a clear image one other um, um, thing I want to recommend is uh, when you test out the binoculars in a store, look around, try to look outside, look for bright, crisp, true color. And you're only going to get that if you test and handle a couple of different binoculars. So some buying tips. Do research before buying. Um, research everything from um, what a, if you're concerned about warranties, each brand will have a different type. Um, ask around, shop around. You might have birding friends. You might have relatives that take up bird watching um, and see what they prefer. Um, get comfortable with your binoculars. Consider a strap harness, definitely do that. I did not buy a strap harness for many, many years. Binoculars will come with a simple strap. You put that around your neck, that's fine. So you don't drop it, but it starts to weigh on your neck. And if you're out birding for an hour or two hours or even all day, it will start to strain on your neck. 
The strap harness is basically just um, uh, like a nylon material and it straps around your shoulders and it keeps your binoculars close into your chest so they don't bounce around. And let me tell you, it is worth the price to get a harness. Are they expensive? No, not at all. Um, strap harnesses on Amazon, I think we paid $15 for ours and it is definitely worth it. I don't recommend buying compact at all. It's just not worth it. It really isn't. The image um, will not be crisp and you won't uh, get certain details in the bird with compact binoculars. Um, I also don't recommend zoom binoculars. Those are binoculars that automatically um, uh, zooms in on the image. And with birds moving around all the time, you might actually start to get like seasick feeling. I have not tried them on a regular basis. Um, so it, it might be something that you're more comfortable with, but try it out. That's what I, I keep recommending. And again, do not share. So highlighting my story with my husband, don't share if you're gonna go out with family members uh, or friends, try to get your own and have your own, all of you have your own pair of binoculars. So that was binoculars. The other component to finding birds is spotting scopes. Um, they're essentially telescopes that are designed for birding or other nature observation. They are not the same as telescopes um, it, it, exactly. Um, telescopes will show an image upside down um, or reversed like astronomy telescopes. So that's what I want to point out that when you're looking to buy a spotting scope, make sure it's rated for nature observation. They can range in price, just like binoculars, $200, $2,000. Um, but don't ever buy one for less than $100 because then you're not getting uh, a quality product. Um, they can be just like with um, the binoculars, they can be angled or straight viewers meaning do they have um, a poro prism or a roof prism? And in the photo that you're looking at on the screen, obviously that has the, um, the angled, uh, or I'm sorry, it's got, um, by the angled view, it meant more if, the, um, if you have to lean down to look in the image eyepiece, or if it's sitting upright and you kind of have to lean over rather than squat down to look in it. But for the most part, almost all spotting scopes actually would have the roof prism, um, being that it's just one lens there. Um, in general, a good magnification range for your bird watching spotting scope is between 15 to 60 times. The size of the objective lens determines the, again, the light gathering capacity of a spotting scope. Um, the larger the objective lens means more weight in the in the actual scope and more money but um but more light means more clarity and detail means a brighter clearer image and when you get a spotting scope obviously you have to get a tripod because these are something that you can't just hold on to and look out it just won't work you do need a specific spotting scope for it and like i said spotting scopes are great when you're trying to observe birds that don't move around a lot um, it's really great for watching um, ducks and geese and grebes um, and shorebirds on water. Not so much when you're up in the forest because then you have to carry around the tripod and the spotting scope. But it is a great tool to have as you develop your bird watching skills and get more into bird watching. So the second thing I mentioned that is really great for um, getting into bird watching is um, field guides. There are so many different types of field guides out there. Um, there are ones specific to an area that you're located in. There are bird guides that use photographs. There's bird guides that use drawings. Um, there's um, uh, bird guides that go into um, the nesting information about the birds. There's some um, that are hardbound, there's some that are um, soft cover, small, big, heavy, there's all different types of field guides. So what I recommend is going to your local library. We, uh, the Douglas County Library System does have a variety of different field guides that you can check out 
and get the feel if, if you like it or not. My first field guide was the Peterson Field Guide to Birds of Eastern North America. And because of that, Peterson is a, um, uses um, images, I'm sorry, drawings, rather than photographic images of the birds. And so that's how I learned to identify birds by using the drawings from Peterson. Compare that with my husband, his first field guide was um, uh, a Nat Geo, which uses photographs. So he just got into identifying birds using the photographs. Just depends on your comfort level. But I wanna um, caution you, if you happen to find an old bird guide, say in the attic of a relative's house, your, your grandfather's house, grandmother's house, you think, oh, this is a great book, I'll get started on bird watching. The naming of birds and the cataloging of birds and the um, families of birds changes all the time. What was once called something, say for example, um, uh, rufous-sided rufous towhee is now called a spotted towhee. If you look at a bird guidebook from um, 1992, it's gonna say rufous-sided towhee, but now a current field guide will say spotted towhee. So you wanna tell your friends, hey, I saw this bird and call it the right thing. Another option, hey, it's 2020, you know, um, we most of us have smartphones. The smartphone can be your friend when it comes to bird identification. There are several apps out there that I can highly recommend to help you identify birds. Some have a fee, to download, such as uh, iBird Pro, that's available for iPhones, but I can also recommend free apps. National Audubon, they have um, free apps, and it's not just for bird identification. Uh, National Audubon, Audubon Society has field guides to help you identify trees, butterflies, turtles, fish, but they also have one for birds, and it's free. So I can recommend it. If you have a smartphone, think about doing that. It's a lot easier to carry around your smartphone. We all do it. Anyway, we carry our phones around all the time uh, rather than a book. But a book is, is helpful to just page through all the different family groups and just start to see what types of birds are out there. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of a field guide. And the one I used, again, is the Peterson field guide. That is my preference when it comes to a bird book. It has the drawings. But you can see that the iBird Pro app um, also shows a lot of detail when it comes to a specific species. So it just depends on your comfort level. Um, something I do want to caution everybody with when it comes to field guides, you could get overwhelmed with information. and so. If you're getting started in Colorado, I can recommend doing either the Peterson Field Guide to Western Birds um, as opposed to a book called um, by David Sibley. He is an, um, a world-renowned um, birder, very knowledgeable. Um, his books are fantastic for field guides. However, the information in them can get overwhelming he will put a lot of images together of different birds and that might get confusing to you if you're getting started with bird watching. So maybe get yourself a beginner um, guide to bird watching and field guides and that would help you out. So exactly how to bird. If we're talking about something beyond your backyard, how to bird, you wanna go out in the early morning hours. That is the best time. That is when birds are the busiest. You have to go out when they are up. So head outside, listen for the birds first, then look for them. Birds are territorial. Bird, male birds will try to attract females by giving a, a, a great song or maybe an annoying song, depending on which one it is. <laughs> um, but listen for them first then look in the general direction of where you hear the birds. My next tip is see the forest, not the trees. What do I mean by that? When you go out bird watching, don't try to be specific to a, to a certain tree. You wanna look at the tree overall and 
look for movement in the tree in general. So the, um, the saying, you know, um, see the forest, not the trees, look generally. But relax and watch the bird because they could be moving around a lot. And um, you need to just be patient, take your time. Take a mental picture. What does that mean? The bird might offer you a fleeting glimpse of itself. And in that fleeting glimpse, you'll see, you'll note, oh, it's got an eye ring and two white wing bars. And I noticed it had tail culverts. Remember that, because that will help you to identify the bird. Um, but I, I do recommend to go out in the early morning hours. The earlier, the better. If you wake up at six o'clock in the morning and you hear robins going off outside your bedroom window waking you up, they're doing that for a reason. And if you want to go find those birds, that's when you have to get out. Some other tips for being a better birder is to practice. Just go out and look for birds, but don't just identify them. Watch them. What are they doing? What are they eating? Where are they in the tree? How are they behaving? What are they singing? Are they calling? Are they flying? Are they soaring? Are they digging for worms on the ground? I recommend to not wear white. Birds will see the white movement and it will startle them and they'll fly off before you have a chance to get your binoculars up to your eyes. Don't be loud when you're walking around. Again, the birds are being startled by our presence and we want to just observe them, not startle them. The experts recommend to bird in bad weather and um, that's just because the birds have to find food no matter if it's snowing or raining or windy. It won't be great but you never know what you might find. And a storm might also bring in some rarities. Learning from better birders, they have experience that they can share with you. Um, listen to bird song CDs. You know, that's just a matter of your, um, your experience with listening to their sounds and recognizing them. Um, once you have passion for bird watching, share it with others because then you have people to join you when you're out looking for these guys. Um, listen, you know, they're, they're very vocal, especially this time of year. This is their, um, their breeding and nesting season. So the males are trying to find females. So he'll be giving a very loud call to attract the female, um, or he's being very territorial because there's another male in the area. So he's giving his song and that will help you find him. Look at every bird because you never know if there's a rarity or if there's an unusual bird in with the hundreds of robins, you might find something called a varied thrush, but you just gotta go look. Practice good etiquette when you go out bird watching. We are observing nature, that's it. We don't wanna interfere too much. You do not want to have this situation. <laughs> Good birding manners means no loud talking, um, no loud cell phone talking, no bright colors. Generally birders, you'll see them wearing um, dull brown, um, you know, maybe even camouflage. I mean, you don't have to go to that extent, but just dull colors. And you don't need a vest to get started, by the way. Um, in the old days, we used to need to wear vests to carry all the different bird guides and a little notebook to keep our life list going. Well, that's what our smartphones do these days. I, I go out sometimes and just jeans and a t-shirt, but it's not a white t-shirt. <laughs> when you're out birding, no sudden movements, just because the birds will get startled when you move too quick. Um, keep a safe, comfor comfortable distance from the birds and caution yourself about using playback. That means if you have a bird app on your phone and you wanna hear um, this uh, or attract a specific bird that was heard to be in the area and you want him to come in, you play his call for him to bring him in. Not always recommended. So please use that um, very minimally. All right. I said to, to look for the forest, not just the trees. There is a bird in this photograph if you're looking too hard, you're not going to see them. Um, I don't know how many people remember um, Magic Eye 
from the late 80s, early 90s, there were posters that if you relaxed your eye, an image would almost like 3D image would pop out of the, the photo. Well, bird watching is just like that. The bird will pop out. All right, keys to identification. You see a bird, how do you know what type of bird it is? Well, we need to um, follow different components to bird watching that will help you identify. I'm gonna go into these eight different components in these next couple of slides. The first is family. Birds are grouped into families. And even if you're not an experienced bird watcher, you know that Canada goose looks completely different than a um, mallard. And the mallard looks completely different than a wild turkey. Birds have groups. And this poster is pretty much birds of North America. That's what we have. It, it's, there's a lot in there. They are all grouped into specific families. You'll have all of the wading birds, such as herons, ibises, um, black crowned night heron. Um, they will all be mixed into one specific family. Woodpeckers are a completely different family. And then you have the ducks and the grebes. The, the family is how a bird is grouped together. And field guides group the birds by family. So if you have a paper bound book field guide, family is important to know, but it is um, something you, you get experience with as you continue bird watching. Second is size and shape. Basically, there's um, good reference. Does the bird match the size of a sparrow? We all know little sparrows, house sparrows. They're all over our stores. They're all over the McDonald's parking lots. They're all over Home Depot. These are little tiny, tiny brown birds. Or is it the shape of a robin? Or is it the shape of a crow? Is it bigger or smaller? The first piece of information you need to identify a bird is its size and its shape. Look at the body shape. Look at the bill. Does it have a hook to it? Look at the tail. Is the tail uh, broad? Is the tail forked? Um, is the tail long? Do the feet have webbing? There's easy things you can see right when you look at a bird's size and shape that tells you what type of bird it is. Um, I mean, as the, uh, the screen shows you a whole variety of different birds, but I think we can all recognize the bird in the bottom left-hand corner is a penguin. You don't know what type of penguin it is, but it's got a body shape that's a penguin. So it does help you with identification. The next is color patterns and field marks. So uh, birds have color. And um, to make it more confusing, male birds will be different color than female birds for the most part, not across the board. But um, that's for more advanced bird watching. But basically look at um, the light and dark patterns not trying to match every feather, but um, just look for common field marks, such as an eye ring, an eye line or eyebrow, uh, wing bars, or does it have a spotted or streaked breast? The diagram on the screen that you're seeing right now, that is um, most, almost every field guide, the beginning part to the book will have this diagram because in the description of a bird, it might say it's got uh, white undertail covers. And you're thinking, what is an undertail cover? Well, you go back to this diagram and you can look that up. Um, the um, evening grosbeak is the color um, photograph on the bottom right hand side of the screen. Um, that's an example of a bird with um, very significant, um, I guess you could say, um, an eye line. It also has um, very significant um, tertial markings. You'll see it doesn't have wing bars, but it has a black wing with the whitish tertials. Does not have an eye ring. So take a look at that. So color patterns and field marks. Just look for outrageous color, 
or white flashes in the tail. Um, again, look for wing bars or eye rings that will definitely help with identification. Um, some more information about color patterns and field marks has to do with the, the wings and birds fly. So you'll see them up above, above you and that will help you identify the bird. For example, the turkey vulture in this photograph has a white um, secondary and primary feathers in its wings. That is an excellent identifier. Even if you don't see the red head of the turkey vulture, if you just see those contrasting dark leading edge or upper wing coverts and a white primary and secondary feathers, you know it's a turkey vulture, as opposed to a black vulture, which is only found on the uh, coastal areas, not here in Colorado. Only the primaries have the white. So color patterns will help you identify a bird. And again, if you take that mental picture, when you see that bird soaring overhead, you'll um, start to recognize different patterns. All right, another thing to help you identify a bird is its behavior. What is the bird doing it and where are they doing it? So much of a bird's identity is evident in how it acts. Watch a bird for a while before immediately looking in a field guide. What is its posture? What is um, the, the flight pattern, its movement, its feeding style? Does it feed on the ground? Does it feed up the tree? Does it um, look like it's trying to catch insects? Does it feed individually or in a flock? Um, how about does it hover in place? Not many birds can do that. That limits your possibilities. In fact, in our area, a hovering bird most likely is an American kestrel. I don't even have to see the bird. If someone just tells me, I saw this bird brownish in color, hovering above the ground, just sticking there, and then he pounced on something on the ground. I knew it was an American kestrel. Um, are they wading in the water? Are they dabbling in the water? Um, are they diving in the water? Mallards cannot dive. They can only stick their butts up when they poke, put their head underwater to try to grab grass or find insects under the water. But um, something like a um, grebe can dive underwater. Does it hop face first down a tree? That immediately tells me that's a nuthatch. So birds have a specific behavior that will help you narrow down your choices if you're trying to identify it. The next thing is the call or the song. Like I said, listen for the birds. And a lot of birds have a very specific call that will help you identify it. And I'm gonna see hopefully if this works. This is the yellow warbler. And this particular bird is very common along riparian or waterways. And his call sounds like he's saying, sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. So I'm going to play it again for you. So a bird call can tell you a lot. I'm sure we all might recognize after today's class, um, the black cap chickadee. He is named because of his song. He says chickadee dee dee. So you, you can, uh, you may be able to recognize a bird just by its call or its song the more times you hear it. So that's why it's important to practice, get out and go bird watching as often as you can. Where is the bird found? Habitat is where birds or any other species call home. That is where they find food, shelter and uh, water and a place to raise their young. Where you are birding and what are you likely to find will help you narrow down your choices. Um, you aren't going to find a great blue heron in the middle of the grasslands. Are you in a canyon area? Well, that means you're probably going to find a canyon wren. Are you down um, by riparian areas? You're probably going to find a lot of bugs, which means you're going to find a lot of birds that like to eat bugs, and that includes warblers. If you're in a forest, probably going to find more woodpeckers. So familiarize yourself with local bird lists and range maps. 
Uh, this is just a handful of habitats. I'm not even going into, um, you know, desert birds or um, Arctic birds because I'm focusing on just what's in Castle Rock. All right. Moving on, another way to identify birds is seasonality and migration. Um, so birds only come into an area during certain times of year for the most part. Some do stay around year round, uh, but for instance, uh, mountain bluebirds will not be found in Castle Rock in, um, uh, in November, uh, about October, November, December, and January. They come back from their wintering grounds in mid February for the Castle Rock area. So seasonality and migration um, is determined by the bird's food, food source. If it's a generalist, it's probably going to stay around for a lot longer year round, possibly like black capped chickadees. But insect eaters obviously are not going to stick around during the month of um, winter months when there's no bugs around. Keep in mind where you are birding because that will determine the species. What is the location and what is the range of the species? And that information is found in either a field guide or the birding apps um, that I can recommend. The National Audubon or iBird or Merlin, those are all great bird apps. And here's highlighting a species that you think, okay, we've seen magpies all over the place, but magpies have a specific area to be called a black-billed magpie as opposed to yellow-billed magpies, which are only found in California. So you see a magpie, you can't call them a, in Colorado or Castle Rock. Don't call them a yellow-billed because that's going to attract a lot of folks that are looking for a rarity. <laughs> so location and range is important for, to identifying birds. Okay, what well, if you don't see any birds? Well, look for a nest. Then the birds will come to the nest, especially birds that reuse nests such as um, raptors, that's owls and hawks, or woodpeckers. So look around for a nest. And um, if you see a bird with nesting material in its bill, follow that bird. Not too close though, but follow that bird so you can um, find out where he's building a nest and then you can sit and watch. All right, backyard birding. Um, Basically, your backyard can be an oasis for birds if you provide food, water, cover, and space. Put out a diversity of vegetation, low-growing plants, blooming plants, shrubs, trees. Make sure there's a water source, and food can come in a variety of options depending on what birds you want to attract, whether it's seed eaters or um, uh, hummingbirds. But, um, Diversity is key for backyard birding and a lot of cover because they are always jumping around and they love to find shelter. Things you can do to help birds. This is your backyard. Put out a bird feeder, put out a nest box. Don't deadhead flowers. They actually do come in handy. Birds will use them in the fall. Provide cover. I mentioned that. Um, don't put out bright spotlights in your backyard. It just, um, Light pollution is just horrendous for birds in general. And please keep your cats indoors. Um, if you are worried about um, leave it, enticing birds to your backyard, that you're worried they're not gonna migrate in, this, in the fall, a bird's migratory urge is primarily triggered by day length um, and even an abundance of food at your feeder. It won't make a bird resist that natural urge to migrate. Um, but your bird feeder might provide a great natural boost um, to help the bird continue its migration. Um, but, um, you know, these are just some of the things you can do if you want to help birds in your backyard. So let's get into a little bit more information about bird feeding in case you're interested in starting out your bird watching in your backyard. Um, so it's important to realize that there are a lot of different types of bird feeders out there that attract different types of birds. Um, we have thistle feeders and that attracts things like goldfinches. You have sunflower feeders that attracts um, chickadees. 
suet feeders will attract woodpeckers and nuthatches. Um, you can have open um, bowl feeders, you can have hanging feeders, but what I wanna stress is that um, you keep the feeders clean once a year at least. Clean it out with either soap and water or um, a diluted bleach solution uh, because there are viruses that can be spread among birds themselves from unclean bird feeders. Um, so make sure you're dumping them out. Don't let mold grow in any of your feeders. Make sure that um, the area, uh, the bird feeder itself is safe from squirrels or bears. If you have bears in your backyard, pretty much just don't put out bird feeders. <laughs> you really will only be able to keep them out for a couple of hours during the day in the middle of summer and not at the beginning and end of each season because that attracts bears. And squirrels are the bane of everybody that wants to have bird feeders out there. Try to get a good squirrel proof feeder. Um, a lot of them that have cages that are weight triggered are great. Don't wanna put out bird feeders, that's fine. Put out um, a bird bath or put up shrubs, uh, plant native plants that attracts them or maybe put out a nest box. Doesn't have to be a bluebird nest box, it can be any other type of nest box. And you are encouraged if you have birds in your backyard to join the Project Feeder Watch. Google search that term, Project Feeder Watch, and provide your observations to ornithologists to get a better idea of what birds are eating and where they are eating. And that helps us determine population trends. If a bird crashes into your window because they have been feeding at your feeder and they were startled by a predator, if a bird crashes into that window, make sure you um, invest in some good anti-collision window decals. Search for that on Google or go to your local bird store if it's open and ask for window decals. Um, it's basically movable UV light stickers that um, reflect the UV light, the birds see it, and hopefully they won't crash into the window next time. And I just wanna warn you that if you put out a bird feeder, um, there's some great things. Um, to see, including nesting birds and birds in general, but you might also attract other wildlife, deer and bears. So be cautious, be aware of your feeders, keep an eye on them pretty much at all times. Okay, a few common backyard birds. Just wanna um, highlight 10 that I think most of us have seen, but maybe not know how to identify them. And I'll just run down the list for everybody. Um, these are the common ones, but you never know what you might get at your bird feeder. So um, what we have is number one, Northern Flicker. He's a woodpecker. Um, you might uh, be, he might be attracted to your yard with suet. The same with number two, which is a downy woodpecker. Very small little bird. Um, we have a very similar bird species found in Castle Rock called the hairy woodpecker. Very similar markings, but he's a little bit bigger in size. Number three is a white-breasted nuthatch. Notice he is crawling down the tree beak first. They are the only birds to do that in addition to the brown creeper. So his behavior helps you identify. This bird likes to come to suet. Then you have number four, broadtail hummingbird. Put out a nectar feeder. Um, don't have to buy nectar food. You can make a simple solution of four, pop, four parts water, one part sugar. Do not add red food dye. Number five is a morning dove. We also have Eurasian collar doves, which are larger in our area, and they've been um, actually starting to kick out morning doves. Both uh, morning dove um, and Eurasian collar doves feed on um, scraps on the ground that other birds kick off their bird feeders. Number six is the American goldfinch. In our area, we also have lesser goldfinches. These guys will come to thistle, and that's it. Number seven is a house finch. You may have one nesting in your, your own front yard or backyard or maybe on the wreath of your front door. Um, they are native species, so their nests are protected, but these guys are very common in our backyards. Number eight is a black cap chickadee. Um, we also have mountain chickadees in our area, but black caps are obviously more common. They love shrubs and they will come to um, suet or sunflower feeders. Number nine is a ground feeder. Spotted Toey. He's not one to normally come to a feeder or even to 
pick off scraps on the ground, but these birds do um, uh, love the shrubs in our backyard. And number 10 is a black-billed magpie. You don't need to put out any food for them. These guys are all over the place. So ending with some birding hotspots in Castle Rock, East Plum Creek Trail, wonderful. Walks along the, the East Plum Creek, great for looking for birds. Number two is um, Memon Ridge. It is a wooded environment. So you will find a lot of Cooper's hawks, but there's a lot of native wildflowers. So I've seen a lot of hummingbirds there. Number three is a grassland mesa. So that's where you're gonna see a lot of grassland birds. And number four, Mitchell Creek Canyon Trail will provide you with a lot of canyon species because of the environment. So you'll get canyon wrens and violet green swallows in that area. Say you wanna leave Castle Rock and go birding elsewhere. You don't even have to leave Douglas County to find some great hotspots. Chatfield is one. The Audubon Center is located just south of Chatfield State Park and does not require a fee to access the trails of that property. That's a great location to go to. Castlewood Canyon State Park, big open grassland with some fantastic bird habitat. Same with, um, I'm sorry, Roxborough State Park is the big open grassland. Castlewood Canyon obviously has the, uh, like the name implies. Uh, but it's very close to Castle Rock, so it's a great place to go. Walker and McLean Pits are privately owned. You cannot access them directly, but you can observe birds in the water, on the water's edge, from the roadside, which is public property. Just don't hop the fence. And then you have the Cherry Creek Trail as well. Great for birding just here in Douglas County. By and you can respect the, um, the current restrictions on Rec the recommendations on travel restrictions during this time. If everything calms down and we are encouraged to leave within 10 miles of our own house and um, we feel safe to go elsewhere, check out some locations in Boulder, check out some places in Lakewood, Wheat Ridge. They are um, great birding hotspots. Um, a wonderful place I like to go to almost year round is Belmar Park, which is on Wadsworth in Lakewood. It has a pond with an active heron rookery and cormorant rookery in the middle of the pond that you can see almost without binoculars from a couple of gazebos. But here's a whole bunch of locations right in pretty much the front range. Um, I didn't expand beyond uh, the front range too much. Colorado has birds all over the place, but I focused on the front range just for consideration of our neighbors and realizing folks might not want to travel 200 miles to see one bird as they start out bird watching. Where else can you watch birds? Online. Check out this web address to find um, a variety of different active bird cams that are set up by uh, folks um, that know of active nest boxes or nests where there's either um, uh, peregrine falcons or ospreys. And uh, you can sit in and casually watch all day long. Something to do and occupy our time while we're stuck at home, right? Some additional resources. Um, Denver Audubon is our local bird club. Simply look up Denver Audubon online. Colorado Field Ornithologist is a little bit more um, scientific based. Those are folks that um, are very much birders, whereas Denver Audubon welcomes folks of all experience levels. Um, there is a list, sir. Uh, feel free to write this one down and um, join uh, the Colorado bird list and hear about updates of birds coming in, um, rarities, um, unusual species or um, just birds that have come back from their winter migration. And there's a lot of websites out there that I can recommend. Um, I think allaboutbirds.org is a wonderful online resource for learning about the birds and what their nests are made of. How many eggs do they lay? What's their habitat type? What does their sound, uh, their call sound like? And what photos do they have? It's a great resource. And lastly, additional resources can be social media. Uh, if you follow, uh, if you're on Facebook or Twitter, um, or 
I think Instagram as well, but definitely Facebook. Look up organizations such as Denver Audubon or Colorado Birding, and you'll be able to follow along what other folks are seeing out there in our great state. So all about birds I highlighted, nestwatch.org is another great resource. They, um, as this photo shows, they provide information on when to look, where to find it, where it will nest, um, and some photographs of the birds themselves. And then lastly is eBird, very scientific, but very useful, especially with um, explore around, um, around the world. And all these websites are not specific to Castle Rock or Colorado or even North America. So a lot of information out there. Um, so the, the internet can be a great thing for getting started with bird watching. So this is what I wanna leave you with is that um, if you love birds, love them back. Um, since 1970, one in four birds have disappeared. That's about 3 billion birds. And they've disappeared for a variety of reasons from predators to habitat loss to pollution, climate change. But you can help. If you are interested in birds and you want to help them, look at these seven simple actions you can do to help birds to make sure that if you get started in this hobby, this hobby will be around for your children and your grandchildren and your great grandchildren. Very simple things we can all do to help birds and bring them back. So here is my contact information once again. Please feel free to call me or email me if you have questions, if you have a sighting. Um, I do recommend if you see a bird, use the tips I just gave you. What is its size? What is its shape? What was it doing? Where was it? And that will help me narrow down um, because I do get random phone calls or even friends and family members who say, I saw a bird in my backyard and I didn't know what it was. Well, there's a lot you can get started with with just that statement. So hopefully you'll get friends and family start asking you, what was that bird? And you'll be able to share some of the things you learned today with them as well. So what I'm gonna try to do is get back to the screen that had the questions. So give me just a second. All right. Um, chat. All right. I see a couple of questions. I'm going to go into them. If folks want to stick around, I know it's after eight o'clock. Um, so I will, if you want to leave, go for it. If you want to stick around to hear these questions, I'll answer them as best as I can. But um, I want to thank everybody for joining me tonight. And um, I appreciate you um, joining me in this uh, technological foray into uh, bird watching. Um, and hopefully, you'll get started or continue your bird watching hobby. So, some of the questions. Um, they found a bird, someone found a bird on a walk later identified as a Merlin. Wow. Uh, it was, a um, Merlin in itself is a rarity. There's not a big population of these guys. Would it be considered a rarity if a bird was found in a place of its winter range during a spring month like April, or would it be more like seeing it before it left? Well, April is a, is a weird time of year because birds are migrating through our area. We are in the central fly, uh, Sorry, we are on the west side of the central flyway in the Rocky Mountain region, and we do get birds going from their southern wintering habitats to their northern breeding nesting grounds. So um, it could be um, a bird that had just been passing through, but even in its breeding range, merlins are not common at all. So yeah, that would be considered a, a great sighting. Um, Question came in about hummingbirds. Um, is that different from the kind of hovering? Oh, compared to the American kestrel hovering. Yes, you could say that hummingbirds also hover. Um, they, their bird feather, uh, sorry, their wings are spectacular. If you ever get a chance, look up um, a slow video 
footage of, of hummingbirds wing beats. They actually will um, move their wings in a figure eight and they're the only birds that can do that. But they definitely hover in order to um, get into the nectar of all of the flowers. So yes, they are a hovering bird, just like the American kestrel. Um, another question, why do the dead heads of flowers come in handy? Um, birds will act, seed eating birds will eat um, old dead um, seeds on flower, native flowers in the fall. So it's recommended to keep the dead heads on because birds will actually find some food in that source. Next question, are magpies usually aggressive towards nests? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, birds, um, birders don't like magpies. And if you have a bird house or a bird box, you're gonna find out pretty quickly that magpies are horrible. They are known to take fledglings. Uh, they're not a, a predator bird, a raptor bird. They're more generalist and um, they take advantage of whatever they can find. And so they've been known to go after little fledglings. It's unfortunate and there's nothing we can do because magpies are a native bird species, which means they are protected by law. Virtually every bird in North America is protected by the International Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And there's some exceptions, including house sparrows and geese and some rock pigeons, which is basically New York City pigeons, city pigeons. Um, but every other bird is protected. Its eggs, its nest, its feathers are protected from use um, or abuse or illegal sale and trade. Um, someone asked, they have a pair of violet green swallows nesting in their backyard nest box. They've been building a nest for more than a week. Is that normal? Oh, yeah. Um, they, on average, and again, the birds never read the books. They never do. On average, um, a female will take about a week to build a nest, but if weather plays a part, if there was a cold spell, she might stop her nesting. Um, uh, uh, her nesting activity, um, but uh, generally it should take about a week. If it takes more than two weeks and you haven't seen any change in the nest, then something happened to either her or her mate and she um, abandoned her nesting activity and moved on to try to find another mate. But again, birds never read the guidebooks. So we might say they have on average a week long nesting time frame. They, they mess us up and they will take longer. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Um, where do birds sleep before they finish their nest? They sleep anywhere they can find shelter. A pine tree, a shrub, um, a tree, you know, they, they all take refuge in different locations. Um, empty cavities inside trees as well. So um, that's why um, providing cover in your backyard is ideal and helpful if you want to attract birds to your yard. Make sure that you have different varieties of shrubs, whether the shrub be um, a lilac or an evergreen or a juniper or um, even um, uh, forsythia bushes, just something they can find cover. Next question is, why is it a bad idea to use a bird's call to bring it near? Because you are, uh, the simple answer to that is playing a call of that bird species is essentially triggering the birds in the area that there is a territorial competing male in the area and he has that male has to abandon his either nesting or feeding activity with his mate and work on being territorial and they may get um it changes their behavior even for a moment and we just want to keep that to a minimum, disturbing their behavior. So um, it's not encouraged. It's basically just discouraged. It, it's not something um, that's illegal. Um, obviously the bird apps all have the sounds, calls and songs of our birds. Um, but just keep in mind that when you play another bird song, you're gonna change the behavior of that target bird for just a moment. So keep that in mind. Um, and then the next question was, will there be a recording of this? I came in late. Yes, we are going to place this online. 
and um, it will be available through crgov.com on the public environmental education pages or the wildlife pages. I'm not sure where we're going to put them, but um, that's where we'll be putting this recording. And what is the rarest bird I've encountered? <gasps> oh, wow. The whooping crane. Yes, the whooping crane. That definitely is. That's got to be the rarest bird. They are highly endangered. And um, there's a, a big effort on the from ornithologists to bring the bird back from the brink of extinction and provide good breeding numbers. But unfortunately, um, you know, they don't have a lot of there's habitat loss is a significant reason for their decline. And um, you just don't find their numbers anymore. And the whooping crane that was found um, through Colorado was down at Monta Vista National Wildlife Refuge, and we got a chance to see it among thousands of sandhill cranes, and he was just by himself. So I would say that was my rarest bird that I've encountered. So that looks like it's it for the questions, but you have my contact information, and I want to encourage you to call or email me or look up by yourself. Take your time to invest in this hobby. I can guarantee it will be very re rewarding for you. And I hope to see you all out on the trail. If you don't know what I uh, what I look like when I'm out birding, just look for someone with her uh, her eyes up to the sky, the binoculars around her neck. So thank you again for joining me. I hope you had fun and enjoyed yourself. And um, we will see you on the trail. Have a good night.